it does seem strange. Uh, uh, January 31, coming up here quick. And, uh, but don't knock it, guys. You guys are, some of you are right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and when they tell you it takes six months to make this, to get everything uh, set up, believe them. When debt is not enough. By the way, what am I going to do after a break? Look for me on Hope Channel. <laughs> Have any of you folks seen my TV program called Stupid Money and Things People Do With It? <laughs> uh, we've done season one, it's all studio based. Season two is all uh, on location. They're into it about three weeks, so we hope to do season three and four. And I hope to do a one-minute family finance seminar uh, and do some other things with Hope Channel. Uh, let's see. Also, have you ever heard of a movie called The Mysterious Note? No. Some of you have. It's a kid's movie. I'm the executive producer. Some of my colleagues say, how, in, or how on earth do you get money to make a 90-minute movie feature length from stewardship? I mean, I really pushed the envelope. And I'm sure the uh, attorneys will be glad that I'm not submitting to them the contracts. Because I pushed the envelope. And this is a kid's movie. Go to the mysteriousnote.com. Uh, pay a fee. You can use it for a fundraiser to send your kids to Oshkosh. Why did I want to do a movie? Because I was tired of uh, watching my three little beautiful granddaughters and other little children being exposed to motion pictures and cartoons that have sexual innuendos and satanic innuendos. And I realized that only one movie can't compete, but at least it's out there. It's all filmed around Andrews University. It's all Adventist. Even there's a pretty aggressive rap song in it. Don't blame me. It's an Adventist preacher out of the Northwest. <laughs> I can't do rap. I've tried doing country rap and it didn't work very good. <laughs> You're going to have to try to do some country rap. That's really slow. <laughs> Also, I'm going to do some writing, and um, I've been asked to go over to teach some in Africa and South Africa, and I told somebody the other day, I don't want to work at all. When you go at 150 miles an hour and, you know, burn the candle at both ends, you got to take a break. But it really has been a privilege. When I started out, I could not read, I could not write. I could not spell. I had such a thick southern accent, you could not understand me. So whenever the opportunity came along to write a Sabbath school quarterly, no was not an option. In our Christian life, no probably ought to be not an option more often. Two other people turned it down, so they give it to the guy that couldn't read or write. And uh, I don't know much about stewardship, but I know a little bit. And uh, let's see, which one of these buttons is the one? Okay. I don't have glasses to see that, so I'm going to have to look over here. You know, you get to that age. I'm a specialist in Walmart glasses. I keep losing them. <laughs> Interesting statement. When debt is not enough. Now you and I, we live in a world that is based, the finances are based on debt. We will never get rid of the debt. 
There's trillions of dollars, one trillion dollar in consumer debt uh, in the United States, and trillions of dollars all over the world. It's never going to go away. As a matter of fact, if you don't have any debt, you have less cash. But if you have debt, you have more liquidity, more cash. I was in Ukraine this past summer, and they have very little mortgage debt, very little real estate debt. So all the stuff I want to talk about as far as uh, getting out of debt from your mortgage and other types of credit card debts, it doesn't even apply. I mean, they, if you work for the government and you retire, you know how much money you get here? It's a pretty good paycheck. Over there, they get 60 U.S. dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But there's no debt. The lady that was my interpreter, she earned a living $200 a month. So, we have debt. Which would you rather have? The stress of trying to survive on little cash? Or would you rather have the stress of having so much debt that you're working hard and you're fretting and you're worried about trying to, to make ends meet? I guarantee you to have no debt and have very little is much better. Guaranteed. Because I've been there. I've been in both situations. Right now, I have no debt. I don't ever plan on going back. When debt is not enough. Okay? If we live in a world that we're consumed with debt, uh, and it's not enough, what is enough? Before we get into that, there are two principles in Scripture. The world operates on borrow and spend, and the Bible teaches save and invest. And when I use the term borrow and spend, uh, we're talking about uh, borrowing money uh, and spending it. You understand that. We're going to talk about what money is. And when it comes to save and invest, I'm talking about saving, meaning Everything it cost for me to live. Even my retirement, saving. Investing is what I refer to as tithes and offerings. So question, what is the interest rate of heaven if I'm going to invest? 10 what you say? 10%. 10%? Well, no, the interest rate of heaven. Well, that's a bonus. It's in the story of the rich young ruler. It's a hundredfold. What is a hundredfold? It is 10,000%. Oh yes, and Jesus says, an eternal life. But yet we hold on to this stuff and this money. Uh, and there comes a point in time when debt is not enough. So let's say you have a debt problem. Let's just read a few things. This comes from a, a website called The Simple Dollar. You're adding to your balance every month. Living paycheck to paycheck. 78% of Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. That's not a good plan. It's a plan, but it's not a good one. When your partner, when you partner up and realize you have double the debt. If you're single and you have no debt and you get married and that other person has debt, you now have debt. That's a stupid idea for somebody that has no debt to get married to somebody that has a lot of debt. I don't care what you say about I love them. <laughs> I can talk more about that. But, uh, your debt payments cost more than your home. When debt stands between you and your dreams. A little trick. Get you a piece of paper. Write down 10 things you'd like to do the rest of your life. Well, let's start with 10 things you'd like to do over the next two years. And then you file them away. Two years from now, you pull them out of your file drawer and see how many of those things you have accomplished. I've done that. I checked off every single one of them. Now, if you want to make it even more visible, 
Put it on the mirror and you look at it every day. Because what's in here is going to get done. And it's either going to come out here or you're going to do it with your hands. Because if you want to create more people coming to church, get people talking and actually exhibiting actions at what a positive church a congregation this is. But they've got to think about it all the time. If you think about money all the time, you're either going to lose it all or you're going to make a lot. If you think about real estate all the time, you're probably going to be a realtor. If you think about Greek all the time, like me, I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> Just kidding. Your net worth is less than zero. Um, you add it all up and can't believe what you see. You can't afford to buy a home when you realize all your money belongs to someone else. Uh, a number of years ago, the average interest rate on credit card was 14%. Well, there's your tithe and offerings right there. It is almost as if God, if, if God gives us money in this pocket and we get in debt, we take it out over here and put it in Satan's pocket. That's about the way it works. Your credit card score starts to suffer. Now, I'm a person that doesn't believe in debt, so I could care less about what my credit score is. <laughs> I don't care. And I have never had any problem borrowing money. So people say, well, shouldn't I have a good credit score? Sure, if you want one just for the joy of it. But I don't care. You don't find anything in the Bible about a credit score. Everything in the Bible talking about credit is not positive. But if you've got to have a good credit score, if that makes you feel safe, well, folks, do you remember the day when you didn't have a cell phone? Now, I told my wife, when, when I retire, I'm going to drive down to Texas because I've got to fix up a house and I'm going to get rid of the cell phone. She says, but it's safety. I said, well, so what? I haven't been found on the road dead yet. And I drive a Ford. <laughs> By the way, it's a 2016 Ford Mustang GT. And when I retire, I'm going to get a little chip and I'm going to retune it and make it over 500 horsepower. <laughs> and by the way, I only bought one car without my wife not knowing about it. She knew about this one. She even said, John, why don't you get you a fast car? Done deal. <laughs> I like fast cars because lawyers told me to stay off of motorcycles and horses. <clears throat> When debt is not enough, if you search the internet, you'll find this bank over in Indonesia. It has so much money that economic growth is stymied. So when we have a culture of debt, borrowing and spending, borrowing and spending, it helps the economy. But we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, if we follow the principles of the Bible, we don't have to buy into it. Um, I still got it here. You know what that is? $50 bill. I'm not going to give it away. I have done this before, but I'm not going to do it today. This is what you call fiat money. What is fiat money? Fiat money means that this piece of paper is not actually worth $50. Fiat money means nothing stands behind this. There's no gold, there's no silver, so what gives it value? It is the confidence that I have in the government that produces this. 
So who produces this? The Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the Bank of the United States. They have told you, and this is just bringing you up to history on uh, how this thing works. The, Fed, the, the king, once upon a time, said, it's my job to make the money because it's going to give you stability and it's going to give economic uh, uh, success. But this cannot deliver either one of those. And so it went from the king to the peasants and then to the Bank of England. The Bank of England said to the government, give us the ability to print money and we will give you success. Give us the ability to print money, we'll give economic stability and we will give you security. So the, the Federal Reserve's job is to make sure the economy is stable. But this cannot deliver it because the debt continues to go up all over the world and pretty soon its own mathematics will not stand up. So that is why the Bible says don't go into debt. If you have too much debt, inability to pay all your bills, no savings, poor credit rating, needs and wants go unfulfilled, constant stress and worry about finances. I've talked to people over the years that have so much debt, they will die owing money. And uh, they don't have the money in their estate to pay for it. So let's look a little bit more about what debt can do to you. Encourages you to spend more than you can afford. So easy credit says, I'm going to spend more than I can afford. If you have Mr. Tightwad on this site, Mr. Spendthrift here, and you use cash, they will exhibit those two characteristics. Give them a credit card, goes away. Why? Is because when I actually, believe me, if I gave this away, it would cause me some pain. So when you actually, because this is a symbol of my work. I've traveled and I've preached and I've studied and you go work at McDonald's or you work as a plumber or a doctor. This stuff represents your value. So when you part with this, it's physical pain. So just think about when you take up tithes and offerings. There's pain going on. However, in tithes and offerings, if it is my idea to give it something that belongs to me, I smile. So we need to try to help our church members buy into the system of tithe and offering. Don't turn into a curse what's designed to be a blessing. And it, they say that I, I've talked to me, I just love to give. Went to church one day, they had a whole bunch of uh, bags up at the platform. They said, please take one and give to the homeless. My wife went up and got one. I said, I'm not going to go do that. I don't want to do that. I just didn't want to do it, so I didn't. And I began to think, why was it? It wasn't my idea. It was the church's idea. I felt like they were pushing it on me. Well, I need an attitude adjustment from time to time. <laughs> In other words, we've got to do a better job in trying to give reasons that are meaningful for people that come to respond with tithe and offerings uh, if we want it to be done on a given on a consistent basis. That's a whole other talk. So it encourages you to spend more than you can afford. If you guys build a house, it'll cost you 10% more than what you sign for on the bottom line. Just the way it works. If you don't want to spend the 10% more, say to the builder, I'll see you in six months. And don't ever go visit again. Just go when he's done. Then, he, then you can say, you must bring that under budget. Or in budget. Cost money. Borrows from your future income. 
High interest rate debt causes you to pay more for the item cost. Um, I could talk about that one, but uh, let's keep going. Keeps you from accomplishing your financial goals. Can keep you from owning a home, leads to stress and serious medical problems. It can hurt your marriage. Depending on what survey, money and arguments over it is the number one reason people get a divorce. Money is the first thing to leave a church. It is the last thing to come to a church. When is debt not enough? If I can't keep my lifestyle going by continuing borrowing money, borrowing money and managing all my debt and everything, pretty soon my tithe and offerings will be the first thing to stop. When debt is not enough, then I'm going to have to apply for bankruptcy, and there's about 733000 a year that apply for bankruptcy in all of its different uh, formats. Look for ways to make more money to support your lifestyle. But what did the gentleman just say? Be content. What is contentment? That is an elusive discipline. He said it so easy and so good. But are you really content with the money that you have? I want more money. How much more do you want? They did a study and found out. It doesn't matter how much you make. Regardless of what we make, we want 40% more. You got a million dollars? What do you want? I want another million. You got a big house? What do you want? I want a bigger one. The contentment. No, part of that comes from living in a culture that is saturated with borrowing and spending. Uh, in 1955, you'll find in Adventist research that that was the zenith of Adventist giving. What happened in 1955? You had the four principles, right, four, four legs of consumerism established. Number one, buying homes. It was after World War II, and so people began buying homes. And uh, that's one. Number two, the retailers had their merchandise. And they wanted to get that merchandise to somebody's house. But how to do that? So the retailer, big box stores, that's the second one. And then automobiles, vehicles took off. And so there's transportation from the store to fill up the house. And then number four is television. It's the evangelistic arm of materialism. How about this? See if I can remember this. Money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary we gather in to worship. Television is the evangelistic arm. The religious side of materialism is prosperity gospel. Uh, narcissism is a mental disorder of materialism. Hoarding represents the ultimate futility of materialism. What is the solution? The Sunday keeping world says it is giving. And I take issue with that. That's not the solution. I was pastoring a 600 member church, shaking hands after church. I don't understand that ritual anyway. I've often thought, I wish I had a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one time, uh, my wife, she would, she's a nurse, and uh, she was working, came home, and she got scabies from the ER. She came home and gave them to me. I shook hands with everybody at church. I hope they didn't get it. <laughs> so what's the solution? I'm standing at the, end of the, at the doorway. A man comes out, shakes hands. He doesn't just drive the automobile, he owns the dealership. And on several occasions, I'd open up my hand after shaking hands with him, there's a hundred dollar bill. So it happened so many times, I said to my wife, I must keep track 
of the door, he leaves. <laughs> you can corrupt the gift, the giver, and the recipient. So giving is not the solution. Uh, make sure I get this right. Uh, is it Zechariah 4, 6? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. What's might? That's a big army. A big army cannot do for me what I need done for myself. Not by might, nor by power. Power in that Hebrew represents a single hero like Hercules. Listen, the Egyptians returned tithe to their gods. Nebuchadnezzar returned tithe. Belshazzar did. And some scholars think he was trying to pay back tithe the night he lost the kingdom. Uh, Romans paid tithe to Hercules. He was their favorite because he was so strong. And in this book I was reading, they said, where do these pagans find this concept? Because they always pay tithe from the spoils of war. I said, I know, I know, I know where they got it. It's called the Old Testament. It's called Abraham. He was tithing the spoils of war. He was influenced by culture. The only difference with him is who he gave it to. That makes all the difference. What is by my spirit? Simple. So, big army, they can't do it. A single hero can't do it. All the best TV preachers in the Adventist church, they can't do for me what I need done. It's the spirit. What is that? The younger generation says, when I give time, I've heard this so many times, it's like putting money into a black hole. We do not know where it goes. We need to shorten the distance from the gift to the impact. Shorten the distance. It's not enough to say that it's paying my salary because the dots don't connect. Besides, what is the purpose of the time? It's not to pay me. It's to advance the gospel. Shorten the distance between the gift and the impact. What takes place behind there. Shorten the distance between of the gift and tie it to advancing the gospel. So preachers, you're irrelevant. I don't mean that too harshly. The purpose is to advance the gospel. You and I just did get to go along for the ride. And God help us not to screw it up. Amen. Is this too harsh? Uh, be content with what you have. I bought a double white mobile home. <clears throat> they say you can't make money when you buy a mobile home. But I did because you make your money when you buy, not when you sell, when it comes to real estate. And besides, in that mobile home, I was warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, than the two or three houses I had previous that were stick-built. And besides, if you live in a stick-built house, can you guarantee that it'll go down the highway 80 miles an hour and still stay together? <laughs> uh, some of you probably remember this. You used to travel. You get to the motel, and you saw this little box beside the bed, you put money in and it vibrates the bed and it's supposed to relax you. It's crazy. I had that. All I had to do is put the washer on spin cycle and the whole end of the trailer would change. <laughs> Here's the deal. I truly was content in that double Y. And some of the houses I lived in, I wasn't content because I felt like I was paying too much for what I was getting. Listen to this. Many poor families are poor because they spend their money as soon as they receive it. You must see that one should not manage his affairs in a way that will incur debt. When one becomes involved in debt, he is in one of Satan's nets, which he sets for souls. So the Bible does not say getting in debt is a sin. It just simply says it is a net Satan tries to trip us up. And I don't need any more nets thrown at me. 
But we just go right along with the rest of culture. Debt weakens your faith and tends to discourage you. We don't need our faith weakened any more than we have pressure on us. Listen. go to YouTube and actually see these little kids trying to avoid the marshmallows. Why do I play this? If you have self-control, you will deal with gratification better. Delayed gratification comes only from self-control. But most of us, we have instant thing. We almost, you know, here, here is an example of mass production individuality. And it's instant. Amazing. They can almost do the same thing for a car, for a house. You can almost, you can go over to another part of the world, they'll make a suit in 24 hours for you. We want it now. And if you think the baby boomers are doing that, the younger generation, they want it now plus a six-figure salary to save the world. We've got about 15 years, folks, for us. Will the next generation pick up the gospel torch and support Adventist mission through tithes and offerings? They're not buying into it. They give. But it's popular to dislike institutions. They're following just what culture has to say. The worst thing you can do for your son or a male is to let him play video games. The best thing you can do for your children is to teach them to develop self-control. How do you do that? Here's a couple of examples. Give them opportunity to develop what I call deep practice. So they've done some study in psychology, and psychologists, they like it. The more things they find wrong with you, the better they like it. But they've done studies in positive psychology. For example, how did Tiger Woods get to be so good? How do some uh, music virtuosos get to be so good? And they, they have discovered that it's not that they are born with these abilities, but they have done what is called deep practice. And that's got different terminology. What is deep practice? I play the guitar, and as I was playing a couple of the riffs today, I just didn't pick it up and play it that easy. I thought it out, I played with it, I played with it now, and I really focused on just a few notes at a time, 
and I really concentrated on it where I could play it whether I'm talking to you or not. That's called deep practice. Even football teams win the Super Bowl by doing deep practice where they execute the plays without even thinking about it. That is developing self-control. I wonder what would happen if we would do some deep practice on the life of Jesus. How do you do that? Do you realize that if you write down five things you're grateful for every day, it'll increase your happiness by 5%? These are atheists that are writing this stuff. Just think what would happen if we would include Christ in the picture. I was at a funeral one time. And the lady, his sister had died. And this lady came to me and said, here, here's my sister's book. It has a list of all the people she hated. I don't even want that book. I've got enough issues of my own. <laughs> Self-control. When are we supposed to end? Four o'clock? <coughs> okay. I'm halfway done, but I'm going to stop. I, but I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a little boy, I would hear my dad preach. He would preach three sermons every Sabbath. I said, Daddy, please make the third one short. He would tell the story. I've hunted for this story. I can't find it anywhere. He would tell the story about Indian Joe. And, uh, but I understand uh, to be proper, I want to call him a Native American and a giant warrior. And this warrior, he had a pony that was good for transportation. He had a gun to get himself food. He had a blanket to keep him warm. And he would go to the sacred place of worship. And he said, Great Spirit, please give me peace. And he would go away with no peace. And he couldn't understand this. He would go back to the sacred place of worship. And he would ask the Great Spirit. And incidentally, when they would ask the Great Spirit, when you find out who it is, it's the Creator God. He said, Great Spirit, please give me peace. And finally he thought, I'll give you my blanket. And he put the blanket on the sacred place. And he said, please, Great Spirit, you've got my blanket. It keeps me warm. I've got to have transportation. I've got to have food. He'd go away with no peace. He comes back. He says, Great Spirit, please give me peace. It seemed like the Great Spirit had a psychological cold. There was just no response. Very silent. And he said, Great Spirit, here is my pony. I'll walk. And you've got my blanket. I've got to have something to eat so the gun helps me get this. And please give me peace. And he went away with no peace. And he stayed away for a while. I don't know if you've ever been angry at the Great Spirit of Heaven. But I bet most of us have at one time or another. And he finally came back. He said, Great Spirit, I don't understand. You've got my, my blanket that keeps me warm. You've got my pony for transportation. Here, you can have my gun. I'll, I'll figure another way. I'll give you everything that I have. Please give me peace. And he went away with no peace. And he stayed away for a long time. I don't understand God, so why do I want to deal with Him? He never talks to me. He never intervenes in my life. How can't I, why can't I make ends meet? I don't, I, sometimes these questions I cannot answer. I could be traveling home, be in an accident, my finances would be in such chaos, I don't have an answer for some things. But one thing I know, in the life of this great warrior, he finally came back to the sacred place because he had no other place to go. 
And he said, Great Spirit, you've got my blanket that keeps me warm. You've got my pony that provided transportation. You've got my gun. You've got every earthly possession that I have. Why can't I have peace? And then it began to dawn on him. A light bulb no moment. A hum ha moment or ah. And somehow or another he crawled up on that altar. And he said, Great Spirit, I give you myself. This time, he went away with peace. You and I will never have peace until God has all of our possessions, including ourselves. Amen. Amen.